Good morning. Uh, just to remind you that this is uh, the 26th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. I just remind everyone now that we've moved into open session, please to ensure that your mobile phones are on silent. Uh, Stuart Stevenson has sent apologies. We are now moving to item two on the agenda, which is take a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider item five in private session, which is relating to the scrutiny of the draft budget for 2018 and 19. Is the committee agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item three, the common agricultural policy payments. Uh, before we go into welcoming the guests, uh, in fact, no, I'm going to welcome the guests first. I'm going to welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Co Connectivity. I'd like to welcome Douglas Petrie, the Head of the Area Officers and Head of Agricultural uh, Profession. Andrew Watson, the Deputy Director for Agricultural Policy and Implementation. Annabel Turpey, the Chief Operating Officer and Rural Payments Operation. And Eddie Turnbull, the Head of Agriculture, Food and Rural Communities and Information System. Before I ask the Cabinet Secretary to make a two-minute opening statement, I would just like to go round the committee and ask if there are any uh, declarations of interest. And I would like to start off by saying that I declare uh, that I have interest in a farming enterprise and that can be seen on my register of interest. Likewise, convener, I would like to declare an interest as a, a farmer in uh, Aberdeenshire. Thank you. Uh, that now means Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd like to give you two minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, I'm grateful for the invitation uh, to invite me and the relevant officials uh, today uh, to provide evidence on the specific topics of CAP payment and CAP IT. Um, as you know, following my statement to the Parliament on the 12th of this month, I announced I was publishing the CAP Plan for Stabilisation. The driving aim of this plan is to improve our customer service. As part of this, I published an extensive payment schedule outlining when farmers and crofters should expect their money. This is with a view to focusing all business effort on giving customers what they need, which is certainty. I'm therefore pleased to be able to say that we are doing that, convener. For example, I can confirm that the Elfast 2016 customers, 80% of claims have been processed and customers will be receiving their payments this week in line with our commitment to start payments by the end of September. So it's clear that progress has been made and we are not complacent, of course, absolutely not, but we'll continue to implement improvements in our systems that underpin this progress. Another key part of the plan is to offer loans to all eligible 2017 basic payment scheme customers. I confirm we're on track to issue this week the first batch of letters to customers and uh, I would repeat uh, the, what I urged in the chamber uh, recently, that all of those receiving a letter should respond by the deadline to take up the offer of the loan and receive payment in uh, November. Get the forms back as quickly as possible if you wish to participate is the clear message. Um, I, I wanted to make an announcement relating uh, to uh, SUS, the SUS scheme, the Sheep Scheme, Scottish Upland Sheep Support Scheme, which is relevant to CAP payments, of course, because they need to be made uh, within time limits. Having listened to farmers and been conscious, convener, of the poor weather conditions that have hampered farmers' ability to gather flocks off the hills and draw their future breeding stock, I've decided to extend the application window for applying to the Scottish Upland Sheep Support Scheme until the 30th November, subject, of course, to Parliament's approval. Um, I hope the committee will recognise that we are, convener, uh, whilst not complacent, beginning to deliver our commitments and we are taking the decisions necessary to improve customer service and business efficiency. And of course, I'm happy uh, to take questions on the topics of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The first question is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Thank you for coming in. Um, I want to touch on the subject of uh, disallowance. And we've spoken before about um, the Audit Scotland assessment of up to £60 million. Um, can I ask if you could clarify as to how accurate these estimates of potential disallowance and penalties were? And uh, were the Scottish Government right not to agree with the estimates? 
Um, well, we don't uh, recognise the figure of £60 million, pounds, um, which the Auditor General has come up with. Um, Andrew Watson here, convener, is the, the expert in, in disallowance, and it might be helpful, I think, if rather than I rabbit it on, if, if he responds to the meat of the question, if that's permissible. But we start off, we don't recognise the Auditor General's figure. Sure. <coughs> so, um, uh, I'm conscious that both the Auditor General and um, Liz Ditchburn and Eleanor Mitchell gave quite a bit of evidence on this subject to the Papals Committee fairly recently, so some of the, the background is, is, is on the record. Um, the £60 million figure uh, quoted by Audit Scotland uh, reflects a combination of potential risk around late payment penalties and wider disallowance, as I think you covered at the committee uh, last time we were, we were here. Um, and effectively, that's a, a figure derived from looking at the, um, the interaction between the different um, regulatory controls that we must abide by and the uh, levels of disallowance that can be levied under particular circumstances. So it's a mathematical construct based on the regulatory guidance on, on penalties. What the Scottish Government has said in response to that is that um, while you can uh, use a methodological approach to derive that number, in reality and in practice, and as Audit Scotland themselves have, have indicated, the actual level of disallowance and penalties um, paying agencies receive depends on a wide range of factors, including uh, experience of individual audits, the evidence that paying agencies can present in response to those findings, questions of interpretation about different bits of guidance, and effectively an overall negotiation process that can take some, some months. On the late payment penalties side, again, that's a topic I know the committee has been interested in in the past. The issue there is um, these are applied retrospectively, again, after a very long process of time, because to, to be um, simplistic about it, I suppose, you only know what your late payment penalties are when you finish making the payments. Uh, so, you know, depending on how late your payments are, then you, you, you have the period of time uh, under which you calculate the, the sum. So, you know, and overall, um, what we've said is that we do not expect to receive disallowance of that amount um, uh, for the reasons I've, I've, I've described. That's do you have any idea what you expect the disallowance to be? Uh, so, no, not, not in the same... So, we don't have a comparable figure, if you like, for, for the 60, if that's your direct question. Um, again, f for us, it is more around the overall uncertainty in terms of the different outcomes that you can, you can get from the process and the, 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 um, the uh, importance of the negotiation with the Commission around the different findings. So, no, we do not have a comparable figure. What we've made clear um, in a number of occasions is um, the known disallowance in penalties. So, for example, um, in terms of late payment penalties, um, we've made clear that we expect the uh, level of penalty for late payments for the 2015 scheme year to be up to around 5 million and for the 2016 scheme year in the region of 5 to 700,000 pounds but these are estimates until the processes that I've described have been completed i think to be helpful the history has shown that we have successfully managed the position we aim to keep the level of disallowance below 2% of total expenditure at the current time, over the last 10 years, uh, convener, we're sitting at 0.99% uh, overall, and uh, these percentages do compare favourably with the UK. Um, some people watching this might think that, and, and correctly think, that five million is a lot of money to pay for a penalty. Where does that money come from? <coughs> so um, that, that would be absorbed within the overall Scottish Government uh, budget. That's why it's so important that we, we do uh, pay scrupulous attention to compliance with the rules, Eve, even if, convener, it does appear sometimes to us that these rules are, are, are on occasion to individual farmers and crofters disproportionately harsh. They are the rules that, that exist, and that's why we, we have had a, a pretty good record over the year, years of operation, of adhering very largely to a, the, the rules involved with, uh, with the, the disallowance element at uh, under 1% overall on average. Cabinet Secretary, uh, the, I, I would like to ask, I think people are concerned that uh, the loan scheme that you've announced for next year shows a, a lack of confidence in the system going to be operating by next year. Could you just clarify when you think the, the system that we have in place will be fully operational and there will be no need for any loans or late payments? 
Well, the, the, the scheme is substantially operational, as I've explained to Parliament, just in very simple terms. It's working. It's not working quite quickly enough. Um, and I'm not really, I'm not, you know, I'm not a fortune teller. My job is not to make predictions about what's going to happen in future years. My job is to ensure performance now in the current year. And that's if, if, if with respect, and being a what I and my colleagues are absolutely focused on. But I am encouraged, as I mentioned in the opening statement, that you know, we, we have made good progress with, for example, the LFAS 16 payments. Uh, uh, and uh, we've paid 80% of those, I think. Annabel Turpey can provide more information if members uh, wish. But, um, but of course, the loans are a practical expedient to ensure that, that those entitled to, to payments will receive, in most cases, 90% of their basic payment around the, the uh, first half of November if the forms are returned on time. Uh, uh, and we've also said that if this is necessary, there will be an LFAS loan scheme. And these are designed to provide a reasonable measure of certainty to people who are, after all, as I once was, as, as you yourself and other members are in business, and therefore do need a, a degree of certainty to run their business, to pay their bills, to run their budgets. And that's why uh, it's, it's not absolutely perfect, but it's a, it's a very pragmatic expedient that I think from the announcements of the stakeholders following the parliamentary statement has been broadly welcomed. Uh, you're, you're suggesting it's working. Maybe I could give you a perfect example why there seems to be a lack of confidence. On the 14th of August, there were 932 payments that were outstanding. There were 53 payments made on the 18th of week ending the 18th of August and 88 payments made by the 25th of August, a total of 144, sorry, 141 payments against the 932 that should have been paid. That left 791 outstanding. Why weren't those paid at that stage? I think you're referring to the BPS Greening and Young Farmer payments yes. at that point, yes. So um, we have been uh, balancing other work alongside. So as I've said to the committee before and members before, that the position we're in is that we are asking staff to work on several years at the same time. It's an inevitable backlog from the position we've been in. Um, what I, so we are making payments as we go on because of the way that we handle debts in our system. Then we make different payments. We have to use our system, our payment system. So Annabelle, I'm going to interrupt you there because by the, by, by the payment forms that you gave us and have made available to the committee, there were no payments made for previous years in those weeks. In fact, when I did further investigation, it was quite clear that there were 129 of those 791 payments wait, waiting for inspection. 221 that were waiting for system validation and there were 582 that were ready for payment so there were 582 ready for payment you paid 141 why would people feel confident that the system is working and that you are delivering payments when they're ready to go since then we have now made as of uh, 26th of september 17646 payments in total um, which is 378 million pounds we have to take debts we have to load the debts that are against people to get them off. So sometimes it is, while when, when a claim is at ready to payment, it may take a bit of time. We don't do payment runs every week because we're scheduling our, we're scheduling our systems to maximise across all the schemes. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned LFAS in terms of Pillar 2 2016 payments. We've made 76.7% of the land management options payments. We've made 72% of rural payments. And again, we started that in August, as we said we would in our schedule. We've made 26% of AICS payments. And again, we started that just at the end of August, as we said in our schedule. And we've made 47% of forestry grant scheme payments. So we're scheduling all the work across the piece. I appreciate the point. I do appreciate the point that farmers obviously want to get the money that they are entitled to and they're eligible for as quickly as possible, but we are working through it and we are getting to the point where we've now got sort of well over 99% of B anticipated expenditure on BPS Greening and Young Farmer. We've got well over 99% on SUS, the Sheep Upland Support Scheme and the Beef Scheme paid. And I would, you know, always take the opportunity to recognise that that's not as quickly as farmers expect, and that's what we're working to get better. But we do quite a sort of complicated scheduling of, of payments across the period. OK, I think I'm going to leave it. There were 582 payments that were ready for payment, but only 141 paid. 
two weeks for after those 582 were ready for payment. Jamie, you want to come in, and then I want to move on to uh, Th thank Mr. Thank you, Finn. Peter. I, I know we're going to drill in some of the specific payments that we made, but can I just ask a general question to the panel? What, what has gone so catastrophically wrong that we're in the situation where we're playing constant catch-up every time we have these committee sessions and we hear evidence from the panel on payments to farmers in Scotland, it's time after time we're hearing the same thing about playing catch-up, never meeting the targets. Is it the IT system? Is it bad management? Is it, is it bad workforce planning? Is it just bad direction? What is going on? Well, this is well-trodden ground, and I think we, you know, to be fair to us, we, we have covered this before. Annabelle and Eddie Turnbull can, can give the, the technical answers. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's, it's relevant to, to point out that, you know, comparing the performance of LFAS payments for 16 and 15, I mean, in the 15 payments, we were late. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I, I entirely accept that. In fact, it took till early November 16 before even the majority were paid. Now, I've just said that LFAS 16, 80% have been paid by the end of September. So I'm just making the point, convener, that um, you know, rather than just constantly paint it black, it would be, it would be good if, if members could recognise that I've just said that, that uh, following the stabilisation plan, following the, the hard work over the summer months that I was engaged with with officials, you know, we are starting to see progress made and payments made on time and most of the payments made to LFAS farmers of the, the net payments they're due. So, um, they, so you know, I, I, I do think it's important that, that you know, we, we shouldn't be drowned out with negativity when in fact we are starting to, uh, to, to see better improvement and the improvement to which farmers and crofters are entitled. So, uh, but read the technicalities, and I think that's what Mr Green asked for, convener. Maybe Annabel and Eddie could help out. Annabel. i just say, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, we're quite pushed for time. I, I think uh, I would like to move on, if, if I may, to, to, to John Finney, because every member of the committee has some questions they'd like to ask you. And, and I realise that the timescale. So, John, could I ask you to ask the next question, please? Okay, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, I had two questions to ask you about the Scottish Upland Support Scheme. You've answered one of them very favourably, and, uh, and I'm delighted that you've taken on the, the issues that's been highlighted to you with the extension um, of the application period. <coughs> I, I've actually written you about the other question, and you have responded comprehensively. Um, but I think for the record it would be helpful and, and it relates to a proposal by the NFUS to alter the scheme and this was in relation to application periods, retention periods and the targeting of payments and I think significantly the phrase that jumped out at me prior to writing it was that this proposal was budget neutral. Are you able to explain why you, were, you haven't gone with that uh, proposal? Um, I, th I think I'm, I'm right in, in referring in, in understanding that the member's question refers to the request made by the NFUS and others that we make sub substantive changes to the scheme. And regrettably, the, there is no scope to make those changes uh, because the regulations simply do not allow more fundamental adjustments to be made. So this is a case that the, the EU regulations that apply a, a prevent us from so doing. A very ha this is a very complex convener and there's not time to go into it, I'm very happy to write to the committee and say exactly why that is because it's very, very important. And Mr Finney has quite rightly raised this, the NFU have raised it, we've looked at it very, very seriously indeed. Uh, uh, however, because we think that extending the deadline is a minor change and because of course that the bad weather has, has made it very difficult for farmers to comply with, in practice with the dictates of a time limit, you know, set in Brussels, it's not really designed for bad weather in the West Highlands uh, and other places, we've decided to extend the, the deadline. So uh, I would personally were very sympathetic to the arguments that Mr Finney and, and others, a convener, Mr Russell has been very active in this for his farmers in Argyll, I should say, but sadly there does not appear to be scope. But I'm happy to work with the committee and if you can find a loophole in the regulations, nobody would be happier than me. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I think it would be useful, Cabinet Secretary, to have uh, a letter explaining that so it can be published with the committee papers. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, the next question is Peter. I'll try and be brief. Um, the, it's about the, the IT system uh, inability to change the hectares of a, of a new entrant farmer uh, who has spent three years trying to get his proper area uh, on the system, and it seems to be absolutely impossible. And he has had loans 
but they've always been a third less because a third of his, his acreage hasn't been on the system. It seems to be impossible to get that fixed. Um, Why? Have you written to me about this case? I have. Okay, well, yeah. I'm not cited today because Mr Chapman didn't raise it with me, but so we can really only... I mean, I'm very happy to, uh, to look or to look again at any individual case, of course, convener, but uh, I don't know if uh, uh, one of the officials would like to talk in, in general about the way in, the way in which the, these matters are dealt with. Well, Cabinet Secretary, when they talk about it, I think farmers expected a letter in 2015 with their entitlements listed out. I think that was a requirement of the EU uh, legislation. A lot of farmers did receive those, but they they have proved fundamentally wrong uh, in, in the assessment and the payments over the period of the five years. Would it be possible to see whether those could be issued out? That might help. Uh, well, could, could I, I mean, it's a very serious question. We take yeah. it very seriously. Could Annabel maybe start yeah. off with answering it? And uh, you know, we have got Douglas Petrie, who's head of the area offices, is here for the first time today, and he's got bags of experience. And, and I think he's actually got some practical information about how these things are dealt with by the area offices in practice that it would be useful for members to hear. But first of all, Annabel. Um, so, Mr Chapman, apologies. I am not, I don't have the information in the case you're talking about in front, so I don't feel um, confident in talking about that directly in the meeting, but we will pick up. Um, in terms of the entitlement letters, um, the entitlements are available on the screens. So on, any online or anybody who has got not online but paper can ask the radio offices to print it off and send it to them. Be inaccurate. Okay, so well, we'll, we'll, I don't know Very. if Douglas wants to come in on that, but I will take that away and I will look at it, but I know that the entitlements that are held on um, are uh, available for people to see, but I'll take away the point that you're raising. Douglas, I don't know if there's anything. I think I'd just make the point that from an area office perspective and, and a customer service point of view, we'd certainly want to, to try and address these issues so that if, the, and I don't know the farming in question, but um, if we can address that by co telephone conversation or a face-to-face -face meeting, then we certainly would. And we have done quite a few of these over the last uh, few months and years, looking at entitlements uh, and are trying to address concerns where the entitlement level doesn't match the farmer's expectation. Um, so certainly we, we've started to address that. It's agreed, it's agreed at the area office that, that this entitlement is, is wrong is on the system, and it's been stated that they could change it manually, but they don't, no, nobody seems to be prepared to change it manually, and it, it, it would need a significant upgrade of the IT system to get it properly onto the system. And the man is, you know, pretty desperate. He's a young lad, newly started. He needs this money desperately. And it's been ongoing for three years. So I just... You know, we need to find a way to get that sorted. Uh, convener, if I, I give the uh, committee some assurance that we, we recognise the issues fundamental that we're having around the managing the, the, the source information around land. I don't know this particular case, but we recognise that. Working with Douglas in the area offices, we appreciate the, 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 the issues that we're having. You'll have heard that we're, as part of the, the programme, we, we are implementing a new land parcel information system. That, that's our current major development that's happening at the moment. And, and the, the, the absolute focus of that is to improve the quality of the, the, the land uh, and information that we've got. It's not to say that, in, you know, that we're working from a bad base, but there are these instances where, where, where the information that we have uh, isn't as good as it should be. So, so clearly that's a, 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 a key point of interest for us at the moment. I think Mr Petrie would have some other useful information to clarify, because with respect, we, we haven't had this, I mean, if members want to tell me about a case they want to raise here and give me notice, we can look into it, but we haven't been afforded that opportunity. So Mr Petrie's got an interesting point to make that I think needs to correct the, the, the picture that's being portrayed C here. Cap Cabinet Secretary, I'm delighted to bring Douglas in. I think we, we need to be careful to look at the overarching aspects of this rather than trying to drill down into we, individual we cases. We can't drill down because we haven't yeah. had the individual case. And, and I think it's unfair to ask you to do so. But if, if Douglas, you'd like to bring in an overarching response to that, I'm very happy to bring you in. And then I'd like to move on to Rhoda, if I may, please. I think it was just to, to, to put it into context, that certainly from an area office point of view, I'm not aware of, of, of a huge number of, of calls on and questions from farmers um, who are questioning their entitlements. Question entitlements and, and getting an explanation, which is we then come to a settled position, is, is certainly happening. But 
not to the point where there's a huge number that are saying the entitlements are simply wrong, but I accept that there'll be individual cases. Thank you. I will leave the individual constituency and, and move to Brader, if I may, please. Yes, can I ask about SRDP payments? And um, the, I think you answered a question to my colleague John Mason some time ago about changes in the, from 2014 to the 2017 uh, scheme. There is a, a degree of concern because there have been cuts in those payments, especially in the less favoured area support scheme, which has fallen considerably. Um, and obviously that deals with some of the, the worst areas in Scotland. Why, why is this and why are those areas suffering more? Well, as far as Elfast goes, I, I assume the member is aware that under the EU rules, the, uh, the, the, the EU specified that Elfast uh, payments must be reduced by 20%, 80% of the former entitlement. I'm very pleased that the European Parliament is looking again at this and, and we will see if the Commission acts upon what I understand has been a recommendation from the European Parliament to look at uh, postponing the introduction of this. But, I mean, the, the decision to reduce the LFAS payment was not made by us, it was made by the EU. Um, moreover, I, you know, I, I, I think I'm right in saying that down south the LFAS was uh, eliminated seven years ago. So we have maintained payments to hill farmers. And, of course, I'm very worried about what Brexit holds because hill farmers are awaiting uh, absolute clarity about uh, whether LFAS will continue to be paid. We haven't had confirmation in writing from Mr Gove, although I questioned him very closely on this and pressed very hard for Scottish hill farmers on Monday, will Elfast, which is a Pillar 2 scheme, uh, be continued to be met uh, in the event that Britain leaves uh, the EU as is intended in just 18 months' time? We don't absolutely know. So I hope Mr Gove, who seemed to be saying that it would, will put that in writing to us very soon. But, you know, the decision, you, you mentioned Elfast, the decision to reduce Elfast to 80% was not taken by us, uh, Ms Grant, it was taken by the EU. Was, it, was the reason for that decision not that you had not brought forward a new scheme under the areas of natural constraint, um, which would have actually given people in my area, in the Highlands and Islands, which face the greatest natural constraint, more funding and continued with Elfast that pays out throughout the whole of Scotland. Uh, and it seems to me a missed opportunity to rebalance the, the amount of funding going to those who are farming in the worst possible areas. Uh, well, we also provide uh, uh, as much other support as we can to, to those areas, including uh, Crofter's grants, uh, for example, and other aspects of the uh, uh, of the finance available, but it's not true to say that we chose to cut money to hill farmers. It's not true at all. Uh, the area of natural constraints was an alternative approach, but would not have increased the available budgetary amount uh, and would have been immensely complex. There was no agreed scheme that would have done what Ms Grant said at all. So I don't accept that that's an argument. And moreover, I mean, I'm arguing very strongly that, you know, LFAS should be reinstated to 100%. That's that's uh, our preference, and I'm extremely worried that uh, the real questions hanging over hill farmers at the moment are to do with Brexit, and, uh, and the, even 18 months after the referendum, a lack of assurance from the UK government that, uh, that, that hill farmers will be valued, not only for livestock production, but also as the custodians of the countryside um, and at the centre of uh, the communities in many rural and island uh, parts of Scotland that you missed an opportunity maybe to support better those areas. Um, you said in defence that you were giving more money to crofters, but the CAG scheme has fallen by two million. Why is that? Uh, I'm very pleased that we've increased substantially the amount of money for crofters. For example, I mean, I think in the 10 years when in government, we've had 800 crofting grants, 800 families getting a house in their own part of Scotland. Uh, and I chose deliberately uh, to increase the amount of money available to help individual families get their own house in their own part of Scotland. Uh, moreover, you know, we have maintained the bull hire scheme, we have maintained crofting grants. I mean, I should say, and, uh, and Ms Grant is presumably aware of this, that general austerity has meant that we have had to uh, make uh, reductions in the budgeting. Uh, in many cases, this was achieved because there the level of demand in those areas that were affected wasn't actually sufficiently high. 
so we chose areas where there would be the minimum impact. But because of the austerity reductions by the UK on our Dell budget, we had to take difficult decisions. I accept that. But frankly, you know, that's what it's like being government. You have cut the CAGS grant. That is clear. I'll come back to the member with individual figures on the CAGS grants uh, and crofting in general. I think it would be useful to demonstrate that, that we have uh, a, provided a, a additional support in many parts of the funding available, but, uh, uh, but uh, I'll provide the, the money uh, figures in respect of CAGS grants uh, to the committee if that would assist. Cabinet Secretary, just before we move on, can I just ask a question on the beef efficiency scheme? It appears that you've cut the uh, monies put aside to that. Is the entrance and the, the application still um, declining and are the withdrawals increasing or have you managed to stabilise the beef efficiency scheme? Um, well, the, the general position is that those who have applied to the beef efficiency uh, uh, scheme and have relevant uh, applications uh, will benefit uh, from uh, the scheme. It funds direct payments to farmers participating uh, therein. Um, as to the detail of the number of withdrawals, uh, you know, these are not figures I just have to hand. I mean, again, I can write to the committee about this, but it was very important that those who applied to the scheme and wanted to go with the scheme, and there are a great many who saw the potential benefits very substantial benefits, according to some farmers to whom I've spoken and have participated, uh, are benefiting from the scheme. There was other criticism, of course, from some farmers, uh, and you know that uh, they're absolutely entitled to their view. But those who wanted and applied, as I understand it, have participated successfully in the scheme. I don't know if officials can add anything to answer the other questions that you put. Of, of people that have yeah. pulled out, uh, maybe. Uh, Annabel, do you have the figures? I don't have those to hand, but as we, we will update the committee okay. following this session. Thank you. Thank you. I think the next question is uh, Richard. Um, yes, uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. First of all, before I go on to my question, can I thank you and, and uh, in particular Douglas Petrie for an excellent visit to the Hamilton area office where I saw for myself exactly the problem that you have where we have a, a, a computer system where people are walking around fields to the last inch and basically counting up, uh, going over a, 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 a roadway and, and going to the very edge of the field. No wonder the system is, is, is trying to catch up. And I know there was a comment about how to load in. So can I thank your staff for a very worthwhile visit to Hamilton area office? to see for myself exactly the problem that you have and why we're in this situation. And I'll uh, basically um, find that, uh, you know, how we're resolving. But to see the actual technicality of how things have to be loaded on, computer, uh, it's like space age, you know, the final frontier. And basically, uh, you may want to give us a, a few updates in regard to that. But... When we talk about the, so I thank you for, I thank you, and I, and I see exactly the problem that you have and why we have comments from people about how this can't be loaded or can be loaded. And, you know, I would prefer if people would take that up with you privately rather than, than in public. Um, so, basically, can I ask you about the Scottish Rural Payments and the schedule of dates? And uh, you've published and said that, uh, you know, uh, that these are going to be paid out in certain dates. Um, like anyone, you, you know, you're waiting for money to get into your bank account. So I'm sure that many of our excellent farmers are waiting on money coming into the bank account. Can you assure me, of, can I ask about these payment dates and the schemes and the schedules and will these dates be met? Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Mr Lyle, for your comments, very gracious comments about the area so staff. It's very heartening to hear a member of this committee acknowledging that good work and it will be greatly appreciated by the staff concerned and I, and I also know that uh, others I think Mr Mason has visited an office as well and and I know the committee decided not to take up the suggestion that they visit an offer as far as I'm aware but I do hope they might reconsider that because there is a lot to be gained uh, from a closer understanding of how things actually work out in practice and the task is absolutely enormous and the the physical nature of the task of carrying this quite heavy tablet around uh, sometimes walking for a, I, from one individual I spoke to in the Perth office over the summer 
uh, you know, 16 kilometres would not be unusual with a very, very heavy pack. This is uh, hard work and uh, we have, uh, I think, 4 million hectares, 55,000 holdings and the data has to be taken to the accuracy of uh, a goal mouth. So Mr Lyle's question is absolutely spot on. It's been a very refreshing to hear this approach. Uh, as far as the payment schedule goes, uh, we have delivered the payment schedule. You have it in front of you. It has been welcomed, I think, by the NFUS and other stakeholders. It's designed to provide clarity and certainty to farming and crofting businesses. Our, our job is substantially to adhere to that, uh, to that schedule. It was prepared after a painstaking set of work with my officials, principally uh, uh, Annabelle in this regard, and CGI and their Vice President I met with over the summer numerous times uh, in the past as well. So, you know, we've, uh, we, we've been aware of what we need to do for our customers. We've set out the payment schedule. That seeks to provide the certainty as business that they want. It's our job now to implement that. And can Mr Petrie, as I say, I, I did actually uh, put on the equipment uh, and have a, a, a photograph of me standing in the, the Hamilton office with that equipment, which, A, was quite heavy, and, and basically... So, is it a fact that staff have to physically walk around every field that a farmer has and take in every inch of land that the farmer has in order to ensure that they get the correct payment? Mr. No, Petrie, like that question, Mr. Petrie I'd, I'd be delighted for you to, to answer that question. Can I just correct something before we go any further, that a lot of committee members actually have visited their own area offices rather than taking up a central visit, and, and a lot of committee members have a huge knowledge. But if you could answer the question very briefly, Mr. Petrie, because there are a lot of questions. Yes, you're correct. So those carrying out land-based inspections uh, are, are carrying the equipment, just as you describe, and they have to walk the field boundaries, every field boundary, and view every uh, parcel of land to determine any eligible features, uh, the crop in the ground. You mentioned roads, buildings, uh, bracken. There's a whole range of things. So, yeah, I, I can't deny the complexity, um, but certainly committed to, to get it done. But what they do, thank you. Thank you. The next question is uh, Fulton. Thanks, um, and thanks, Cabinet Secretary and panel, um, for your attendance. Um, I was going to come back to something you mentioned earlier about the, uh, the basic payment loan scheme and the possible uh, additional uh, loan scheme. What, what conversations um, did you have with the various stakeholders and what concerns did they raise to, to establish this? this plan, if you like? Um, well, we're really more or less in constant dialogue with the key stakeholders and the NFUS, obviously, but also the Crofters Federation, the National Sheep Association, the Scotch Beef Association. I mean, we're, um, we, we, we really do meet with them about all sorts of matters, as you would expect, on, on, on a virtually constant basis. I mean, I met with the NFU just, just recently to discuss their uh, future plans, for example. Uh, but it's fair to say that all of them have advocated that uh, in the absence of being able to predict and guarantee perfection in terms of meeting the payment, uh, the expected payment profiles, that we provide a loan scheme precisely because it gives farming businesses with the uh, certainty that they know that most of their income, in fact the vast majority of their income uh, in, from the particular schemes where there are loans, will be paid at a certain time. Um, and I think the basic the, the, the provision of increasing the amount of the payment in the basic payment loan scheme from 80% last year to 90% this year has been specifically welcomed by stakeholders. Uh, and the announcement that if we require to have it, convener, there will be an LFAS scheme so that LFAS recipients know that they will get their money next year uh, 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 around uh, you know, the, the uh, period of April, May, um, again is welcomed. So I think the stakeholders, whilst obviously wanting the IT problems all to be sorted out, as we all do, they all welcome the pragmatic approach that, that we have taken last year uh, and the, the, the improved version of, of it, which we are taking this year, and also announcing it. I was very keen, to convener, to make these announcements in September at the earliest opportunity of this parliamentary session. At June, 
we decided amongst us that we would have several meetings, a whole workload, a range of discussions with CGI, uh, that we would come back to Parliament in the first available opportunity, namely the second week back. That's exactly what we did on the Tuesday of the second week back, so that these businesses around Scotland get the maximum notice of when, they're going to, when they can expect to receive the majority of their funds. So I, I just wanted to um, ask a wee bit about Brexit as well, because you've mentioned um, Brexit previously. Was that, uh, was that a factor in creating this plan? Um, and I suppose just in the, the, the interest of time, you, you've sort of already answered there, I don't think you're going to be able to give a definitive answer, but do, do you know when you would be able to, to say for definite whether the, the additional loan scheme for Elfast would be, would be used? And uh, I, I, I'm taking into account already your previous answer there. Um, well, I have alluded to the, I think, the concerns that are manifest in, in rural Scotland, particularly amongst hill farmers, but not only amongst hill farmers, particularly amongst now Pillar 2 recipients, because the written assurance that we have, which we welcome from Mr Gove, applies only to in-farm support and Pillar 1. We are told that there is an assurance for Pillar 2, but we haven't yet received that in writing. I think some member of the House of Lords may have received something, but you know we are not the House of Lords. We are elected people here. Uh, so it would be quite nice to get the courtesy as elected people to be told things. Uh, but there we are. Um, so I won't dwell on that. It's not like me to labour labor the point, as you know, convener. The point you've made, I haven't got... I, I, it, it, uh, but uh, this, this, the second question, just remind me what the second question, Mr McGowan. Um, regarding Brexit. Um, no, is that, sorry. Well, no, that's the first one. Uh, regarding the... Um, regard, regarding the... If you would have a, a, date, a date in mind when you would know... Uh, yes, good question. Uh, 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 well, we haven't fixed a precise date. I mean, what we have done is, is to reassure Elfast recipients that they will get their money around a window in April, kind of May, probably May next year, you know, rather than September and October. That, that's the key thing. But we will come back to Parliament, this committee probably, uh, convener as, uh, as we do, <laughs> uh, to provide full information as soon as we are available. But that, that decision will be informed by, you know, how well we process everything else in between and also the timing of inspections, and inspections have to be completed, uh, we believe, uh, a prior to payments being made. And, you know, Mr Lyle has very helpfully cast some light on the hugely onerous nature of the inspection work which we, we, we have to complete. So uh, I'm anticipating it will be sometime early next year to, to answer the question that we will come back and say whether an LFAS loan scheme is needed or not. And if there is needs one, there will be one. Thank you. I just remind everyone, please, to keep the questions as short and focused as possible, just because of timings. There are quite a few questions to get through. I'd like to bring Mike in with one question and then move on to Jamie. Th thanks, happens. Convener. It's my understanding that a, l a large minority of farmers did not take up the loans last year. Um, so could the Minister tell me what that percentage is? And therefore, what assessment, because we're now going into a new loan scheme, so what assessment has he undertaken to see why there hasn't been a better uptake of these loans, because it's, not, it's unusual, isn't it, for farmers not to, to take, I would have thought, the loan system schemes that have been on offer. So what proportion have not taken them up, and why? OK. Um, well, to, to answer your... I mean, I, I can pass to specific uh, stats to, to Andrew. We've got a whole array of, of them there. But, but you're absolutely right, and I, I think we have been over this ground, actually, if I may say so, uh, before, uh, and that uh, a number of farmers decided not to take up the loan scheme. What assessment did we do? We immediately carried out an assessment by contacting the farmers to say, look, you can take out this, this loan. There is no interest. The only circumstances in which there would be any interest would be if the loan was in excess of your, as, as, of your entitlement and there was, therefore, a repayment of that excess and that excess was not paid, repaid within the agreed time, which uh, is 30 days. So, well, it, it's, it, we, we uh, absolutely want, wanted and want farmers and crofters to take the loans. I think there were some individual farmers who may have thought that they do not like to have a loan, um, and we therefore uh, took the opportunity to communicate individually with them to say, look, uh, it, it is 
effectively an advance payment. We have to call it a loan, but it operates as an advance payment to most intents and purposes. But it was the individual decision convener. I mean, people are free to make their own decisions in life. You know, the government isn't responsible to overturn, nor should we, people who perhaps for moral reasons decide they do not want to take up a facility which is available. But I did stress in Parliament the money is for farmers and crofters. It is for you. It's not being taken away from the NHS or any other government service. Uh, and I'm very pleased that Mr Rumbles has chosen to raise this again today because it's given me the opportunity to repeat that plea to farmers. I don't know if, if you want the stats then... Why they don't take it up? You don't Sorry. know why, though. Sorry. Well, you, I... you know, you would have to ask individual farmers, okay. but I have given an explanation in the chamber and now again in the... You know, happy to. to I'm, I'm to loath to actually that help. bring in uh, Andrew or Annabel, but just purely on time. I, th I think that, that you've answered the question as best you can, Cabinet Secretary. So I'd like to move on. Jay. I'm to write to let us know what proportion of people haven't taken up the loan. Um, could we get that it, in writing? It would be helpful if, if you could give us those figures. I'm afraid I, I need to move on with the questions, Cabinet Secretary. Jamie Green, you, yours is, is the next question. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I ask which uh, course of action uh, has been decided on in terms of remediation plan for the IT system? Uh, obviously, there were, you presented a number of options available with various costs and pros and cons associated with it. What was decided and what's the estimated cost of going down that particular route? As we know, the Fujitsu report to primary finding was that the system was fundamentally sound, but it needed to be remediated. So you're absolutely right, Mr Green, to say that that then meant that after we'd carefully analysed the Fujitsu report, after we'd discussed it with Mr Thorne and CGI, uh, and had an interchange uh, at some length, I think, as I recall, with this committee, uh, we decided what to do, and I think Mr Turnbull is best equipped to provide the answers to those questions, if you may. Yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of the... We, we shared with you the 23 points that were raised uh, in, in the Fujitsu uh, report, and we've been working to those... Clearly, there, there are uh, subordinate actions under each one of those uh, key recommendations. We have prioritised those. And I'd restate to the committee that the Fujitsu report wasn't just focused on the, 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 the CGI element of it. It was focused across the whole uh, of, of the, 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 the IT organisation uh, within uh, ISD. So we have a, 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 an arrangement now with uh, CGI around what they are responsible for correcting when we set out a work order, when we set out what we are in, intending to uh, produce uh, out the next, in the next release of the system. So we, we, we discuss that in advance and, and we, we agree a cost around what, 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 what that is. Yeah. The, the cost of that? We, we, well, if you're asking me, do I know the cost of the full remediation as laid Indeed. out in the Fujitsu plan, the yeah. answer to that is no because we are working through pieces at, at, at a time uh, depending on the impact that the, 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 the remediation will take. So uh, I think that's a simple answer. OK. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, uh, you published a uh, stabilisation plan with uh, six headings and 31 action points therein, uh, which contained a number of uh, improvements that you're looking to make across the board in terms of how you how you work. Um, can I ask, uh, one of the things that was missing from the plan, I have it in front of me, is, is dates, deadlines or review points. In the future it has the commitment and the action, but uh, there's no real understanding of how you will uh, uh, feedback progress on those action points or indeed any deadlines you've uh, tagged onto those action plans. That would be quite helpful if you could... Uh, okay, I mean, I think, uh, to be fair to ourselves, convener, I mean, the, 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 the key dates are the dates and the schedule of payments. I mean, the key dates that our customers, farmers are interested in is when they're going to get paid. And we have provided, with respect to Mr Green, uh, as members know, those key dates. That's the whole point. We have provided a schedule with, in each case, indicative dates. Um, so I think those are the dates that really our customers are interested in. And I would respectfully suggest we have done that. However, um, it would surprise me greatly were I not invited to come back to this committee uh, and in the event that that occurs, then I, of course I'm happy to keep the committee, as always, fully updated on all germane matters. And, and Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure the committee will take you up on that opportunity 
and at that stage to, to see the dates and, and probably a review of costings of, of what it's actually cost. And on that note, I'm going to move on to uh, John Mason with his answer. Uh, thanks, convener, and Question. thank you too for the visit I had to the Air Office. A uh, convergence money, uh, I think 160 million, is Michael Gove going to give us it? Well, I, I did take the opportunity of my initial meeting with Mr. Gove in June at the Royal Highland Show and, yes, and on Monday of this week to um, reiterate uh, what I believe is, uh, is um, really an unchallengeable claim that, Scot that Scottish farmers, in particular whole farmers, have been shortchanged to the tune of £160 million. And this is very simply because Europe decided that uh, some years ago that there would be funding for those farmers in the toughest areas who receive the least payment. Uh, in Scotland, our farmers fell into that category. Uh, and uh, that money, £190 million, pounds, was paid uh, to the UK as the member state only because of Scotland. In other words, had Scotland not existed, the UK would have got zero. And that is because the farmers in other parts of the UK's average payment exceeded the minimum threshold of €90 Euros per hectare. Uh, we were about half of that. So this was money that was intended by the EU solely to benefit those who received the least per hectare. That was the purpose of the money. And therefore, a reasonable person would conclude that that money should have come to Scotland for our hill farmers, worth for each farmer over the six-year period £14,000. So my point to Mr Gove was that this money was appropriated by the Treasury, because they can, uh, and ever since then, repeated uh, ministers in the UK have promised that they would look into this and have a review. And sadly, uh, and it's a matter of record, and it gives me no pleasure to say so, of course, Every single minister has breached that pledge, including Mr Gove and Mrs Leadsom. However, Mr Gove did agree on Monday to have discussions, uh, and I look forward to taking part in these discussions in a constructive manner, as always. Thank you. Okay, next question is, uh, um, we, we, if, it's, if it's a very quick yes or no question, Rhoda. Uh, uh, okay, a very quick Wish him well with his discussions, but if that money comes to Scotland, will he guarantee it goes to those that are paid least, which is in his gift? Well, it, it won't be him guaranteeing it if it comes to Scotland, it'll be me. And That's be what I'm saying, uh, will you well, guarantee? Well, That's it's what a I'm fair saying. question, and I will guarantee that that money must come to rural Scotland. I mean, it would be absolutely uh, disingenuous. Uh, I would not be part of a government where if we get this money back, it goes to anyone other than the, those in rural Scotland who deserve it. Sorry, I, not I, I, I'm not sure that was the answer. answer. No, the that question. wasn't the answer I was looking the, the, for. The question no, was because quite it was a categoric specific, assurance. So. Maybe you weren't expecting that. But I want this money for, for hill farmers who... because they have been shortchanged by so, the UK government. So this money has been snaffled farmers. by the UK. It's an outrage, and I'm determined that this be put right. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity, right. thanks to Ms Grant, to raise this point here. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question. Uh, Mike. Thanks, Convener. Um, I'd like to ask... Um, the Minister, what work the National Council for Rural Advisors is undertaking, what the out outputs will be, and um, if and when these outputs that this, that this Council is doing will be made available to the public so that we can see um, what advice they're giving you. Uh, well, I was delighted to attend the first formal meeting of the National Council uh, just last week, uh, and their role is to provide advice uh, and recommendations on future rural policy and support to help create a vibrant uh, rural sustainable uh, rural economy and that includes agriculture but obviously it includes tourism it includes renewable energy uh, it includes community developments uh, and a whole range of other things not only farming uh, forestry and fishing and so on um, uh, and also it's to provide advice on the implications where uh, the brexit plans to proceed the work, the, the group met informally in August. They include four agricultural champions who themselves cross-cut across rural issues as a whole and have been appointed in January and were appointed by, by me not because of Brexit but because of the vision that we published in the, uh, in the summer of 2016 at the Royal Highland Show which uh, vision was the result of a detailed consultation which my predecessor initiated and which set out a vision for the future rural economy in Scotland. So I'm delighted with the work. When, when will they have their outputs to answer that question? Uh, we have asked for a, an initial uh, interim 
a set of, uh, of recommendations before the turn of the year and a final report uh, uh, in the spring to summer next year. Uh, and I'm delighted that so many people, uh, independent people, of course, as, uh, as Parliament's uh, uh, motion required, not a group of stakeholders, but people who are independent, uh, uh, I'm delighted that they've offered voluntarily of their time and expertise and knowledge uh, to help inform uh, our future rural uh, policy with a view to maximising sustainable development in, our, in rural Scotland. Could I just... If I can just say at this stage to the committee, there were a lo a quite a lot of questions on Brexit and uh, we are not going to get to those questions today. Uh, we are going to be asking the Cabinet Secretary and I hope that in November he'll be coming back to the committee where he, we can delve more into Brexit and the effects for agriculture. So I'm afraid committee members, I'm not going to get to those questions. There are three questions that I would like to take. There is uh, a follow-up from Mike, John Finney, and then Peter Chapman. Uh, those would be the last three questions that I can take. So, Mike, a, a brief follow-up, yeah, yeah, followed yeah, by John Finney. Absolutely, on what, you, what the Minister has just said. So, if I've got this right, the Minister appointed this um, National Council of Rural Advisors back on the 22nd of June, but they only had their first formal meeting last week. So, actually, what I'm asking is, actually, have they been at work for the last three months, or have they just started work last week? Uh, it's a matter of urgency, this issue, and I was wondering, have they actually started work yet? Well, I think I've answered that already, but just to, re well, to restate, they met informally in August with uh, government officials. They were briefed fully about the, the remit, about the scope, about how they would work. They would have access to assistance in terms of information and advice from officials. Uh, that was during, of course, the summer, and people do have summer holidays, and it's, I think members would accept it's, uh, it's not customary to have business as usual during the summer when many people are away, and therefore we had the first formal meeting, uh, I think, uh, just uh, last week, uh, and I can assure you they're working hard. But, um, you know, Mr Rumbles also overlooks the fact that there are four very senior uh, people, Archie Gibson, Henry uh, Graham, Johnny Kinnaird, and Marion McCormick, very, very senior people that will be known to members, that have been working hard since January in all aspects of the rural economy. Uh, and the aim convener was to have these four individuals to sit in the National Council with the legacy, the, the bequest of the work that they've been doing. And my goodness me, have they been working hard and they've had subgroups. So, you know, if it's hard work that Mr. Rumbles wants, then, you know, I'm not disappointing him. Okay, John Finney, sorry. Very briefly, Cabinet Secretary, I have written you on this as well, but I appreciate you have a heavy workload. Um, I don't doubt the quality of people involved or um, their, their endeavours to date or in the future. Um, following the cross-party group in Crofting, there was a concern that the Crofting communities weren't directly represented. Is that something you'll consider, please? Uh, well, I, I, I have written, as I think I said to Parliament uh, recently, to over 200 stakeholders, the the, at the meeting of the National Council of Rural Advisors, they decided that they wished to engage with the Crofters un Union and the NFUS and others. Uh, so we've already involved stakeholders, which Parliament asked us to do, and we have done, or required us to do, and we have done. Um, they will engage with Crofters, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very happy to give that undertaking to Mr Finney, and I will make sure it's, it's followed through. It's absolutely essential to me their voice is heard. Of course, we, we are working separately in a crofting development plan, which I think will hope to encapsulate some of the aspirations that people will have in the crofting communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Final question to, uh, and, and it is one question to Peter Chapman. Uh, it's about the SRDB funding, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Why was the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme uh, funding cut from £350 million to £308 million? Uh, Well, there, there were, as I, I think I did explain earlier, across the board of SRDP uh, schemes, the need to, to make uh, savings. This need was brought about because of a, an overall reduction um, to the Scottish Dell budget available as a result of the UK budget set. Of course, and our budget is dependent upon that, uh, and that meant that we had to take decisions. Those decisions were made in order, if you like, to avoid um, the scenario where we uh, received less money available from Europe 
so we sought to do that to maintain the maximum amount of money available from Europe. Sadly, of course, convener, the UK government cut our budget. So, you know, uh, running a budget as I do, you have to uh, you have to manage things accordingly, and that's what we had to do. And therefore, if you look at the the many of the components of the SRTP budget, and one or two of them have been alluded to, you know, we had to make some adjustments to them. But that was really why um, why uh, we have taken that step. So, uh, uh, and, and indeed, the overall discretionary budget in Scotland is expected to be 9.2% lower in real terms in 2019-20. Uh, compared to 2010-11 uh, as a result of UK austerity cuts. Uh, and of course, that's on top of the 160 million, which I hope all members of all parties will agree should be paid to Scotland because, or paid to Scotland for our rural communities as it was intended. That million was never in the budget in the first place, so that, that's a complete red herring to mention the 160 million. It was uh, well, never hope, in there in the first place. Well, I hope that you will, you will, that you will support, as former members of the Conservative Party did, the moves to get this money for Scotland. Uh, I, I wait and see what the Tory party says about it. I don't know, but that's obviously for the Conservative Party to make. But the budget cuts were, of course, imposed by a UK Conservative a, a government. So I think there's no hiding place so far as that is concerned. And that probably, Cabinet Secretary, is allowing you to have the last word on that. And that's where I'd like to suspend the meeting. But before I do so, I'd like to thank you and your team, Cabinet Secretary, for coming in this morning and to say that we would welcome the bits of written evidence that you said you would give us and also that we will be taking you up on your kind offer to reattend the committee uh, to discuss Brexit and also uh, subjects to doing with CAP IT at the relevant moment. Cabinet Secretary and your team, thank you very much. I now suspend the meeting. I'd like to reconvene this meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and move on to agenda item four, which is the Islands Scotland Bill. This is the third session on the Islands Bill that we've had. And this session is specifically on part four of the bill and the financial memorandum. I'd like to welcome from the Local Government Boundary Commission, Ronnie Hines, 
uh, who is the chair, and Isabel Drummond Murray, who's the secretary. I'd also like to welcome from the Western Isles Roddy Mackay, who's the leader, and Derek Mackay, who's the deputy returning officer. Now, there are uh, questions uh, for, for each of you. If I could ask you to indicate uh, when you would uh, like to respond and try and pick, you won't necessarily all get a chance to answer every question, so if you'd like to pick the ones that you'd like to come in on, and if you indicate to me, I will call you in. You don't need just to remind you that haven't given evidence before, touch any of the buttons in front of you. That will all happen automatically. So I'd like to move on to the first question, which is from Rhoda. Thank you. Um, historically, Orkney and Shetland have had protected boundaries um, for election purposes. Why was this not the case for the Western Isles? Who'd like to answer that? Roddy. Yeah, it seems anonymy that people... Uh, <laughs> have said in the past that it was as if it was just forgotten during some administrative hiccup. But you're, you're quite correct in saying that uh, Orkney and Shetland were specified in the Scotland Act 1998. Um, the Council is pleased that this opportunity has been presented to address this anomaly and um, we think that this will allow the Western Isles to be treated consistently with the other island areas. And we're th we are also, I should point out, the largest in terms of populations. So it just ensures that we are, as an island, represented at parliamentary level. And we're very pleased to have the opportunity. Ronnie, do you want to come back or are you happy that, that, that summarises it? Okay, sorry, Reda. Do you want so, given, given that the bill's taken that forward, will that have any implications um, or give confidence going forward? Or do you expect just because that will be the status quo that that will work quite well? Is there any unforeseen consequences of this, really? No, yes. None whatsoever. Everyone's happy? No. Good. Okay, um, to the, do you want to ask the Boundary Commission any specific question or? Well, I was, I was, that was my question to the Boundary Commission. Um, you know, what, what will be the implications of this change? Well, we legislation, I see no implications of an adverse nature from the proposal for the Western Isles to become a single constituency. It will be straightforward, I think. Mm -hmm. And you don't think it would open the floodgates for other requests? From other islands? Or from other parts of Scotland? Um, well, we don't anticipate that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard, I think you've got the next question. Yeah, good morning. Hello, Mr Hines. How are you? It's been a long time since you and I have seen each other. Um, as you know, I was previously a councillor in North Lancashire Council, uh, and the new system came in in 2000. The, the change in the law 2004 brought in the new multi-member ward. Um, how does the Boundary Commission and also the, the, the Council uh, look at the situation about the practical issues that the current three, four-member ward system creates and what impact of switching to a one or two-member ward for a particular island or islands uh, would have the effect of the number of councillors covering island areas? Okay, well, I think I'll have a first go at that, Isabel. May want to contribute as well. In terms of the um, the three and the four member ward situation, one of the things that we said in our submission to you, I think, is that in the course of carrying out the last, the fifth reviews of local government as a whole, um, we were given notice by, by a number of councils that, that would have been helpful if we'd had more than a three or four member ward option to work with, and that was throughout Scotland, not just on the island areas. So, from that point of view, the Commission welcomes. Um, the proposal in the legislation that there could be occasions when one or two member wards could be applied in the designated island areas. We think it just gives us additional flexibility and that's always welcome when you're trying to draw boundaries, particularly in, uh, in island areas. So we think that's, that's a good thing. Do you want to add anything to that in principle? No, I think it is about the greater flexibility it offers us. As far as the Western Isles concerns, would, would that have an impact on, on, on you as well? Is, is there something we need to consider there, or, or what are your views on that? Yes. <clears throat> we agree that uh, our aim is that if we can get more flexibility as a general picture for the Boundary Commission around this aspect of one or two as opposed to three and four, uh, that, that would be an achievement for us, uh, we have to say today. We strongly support the provision because it provides an opportunity for us to address concerns in some island areas where a council is too remote from the island community served. Um, we have found that uh, there are anomalies within our own system where we feel that if, if, the, if the regions, if the natural townships, natural communities within 
uh, our island areas are the drivers for the board and then the board membership is built on that rather than sometimes we feel that because they don't have the flexibility the boundary commission are driven solely by numbers and the ratios and it has led to some unnatural uh, combinations uh, in, in the sense of one village or one township being much less represented than another. And we just feel that if they had the flexibility to do this in the island context, it would mean that island communities and natural communities are better represented and actually would enhance the democratic representation and the process. So it would be good in our context, we feel. Sorry, uh, Richard, I, I yeah, asked a question. Taking on board that the Boundary Commission and councils in the past looked at the sizes of a particular ward and tried to even it out and different, even went down certain streets that people like me said, no, we shouldn't go there, but we did. Um, how would it be with uh, an island uh, where there will be a, a lower proportion of electors compared to the, the, the three or four member ward that straddles into it? Um, so how, what would your view be on creating smaller uh, one, two member wards where the, the electorate may be 50% less than the three or four member ward that it previously was? Well, Ronnie, yeah. it wouldn't matter if the electorate was smaller um, because it's the ratio of the electors to the representatives that really matters. But I think I get the thrust of the question. Um, given that we're focusing on island and, in large respects, rural communities, it does raise the possibility, particularly if you've got um, more strings to your bow, i.e. one and two as well, as well as three and four member wards, that you could have quite different um, ratios within a given council area. Um, so we think we just have to go into that with an open mind. We haven't yet sat down and deliberated on what our strategy and our approach and methodology would be, but I think we recognise the spirit of this legislation. And although we continue to have to work under the rules that apply for all local government, reviews, namely that parity remains paramount, we've been able to use special geographical circumstances in the past as a way of leavening that out, and we see that we'd probably have to do that to a greater extent if we're looking at island communities. So part of our approach will be to talk to the councils and to talk to the communities and take their views very carefully into account when we decide how to strike the right balance between parity and closer community representation on the other hand. Thank you. Fulton, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. It's kind of following up from uh, Richard's point panel. Um, the, you're talking there about, um, you know, perhaps uh, different types of representation of you know, councillors in different places and where there's maybe not been or, or, or ward sizes and, and numbers. But what do you think about overall uh, council numbers? Is that something that you can see changing, you know, firstly from all the island communities and then, I suppose, secondly for the, the Western Isles? Uh, is that something you see changing or would it be going with the current number of councils that you've got after the last review and then distributing them about, so, you know, or do you see a, an actual increase or decrease, you know, possibility? Okay, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and pick it apart a little. We don't go into it with a preset notion that the existing number of councillors, either in the England areas or for Scotland as a whole, is a limit on the work that we're about to take on. Um, if you look at the way we went about our business in the last reviews, you can find just about as many examples of areas where the number of councillors in a council went down as went up. Um, and that wasn't just because there was an overall total that we were trying to work to, it was a reflection of the work that we had done. And the same would apply if we're looking at the island areas. Um, so we don't go into this with the idea that if there's currently uh, 22 on, on Orkney, there will always be 22 on Orkney. That's not our approach to this. This seems to me to be in spirit quite a different kind of recognition of the nature of island communities. And I think it would be tying our own hands if we went into the business saying the number of councillors you've currently got is some kind of ceiling. Bear in mind, uh, and the Western Isles will, will give testimony to this, uh, that sometimes when you ask councils themselves what is the answer to the question, the right number of councillors, you can be surprised. They told us on previous occasions that they had too many. So some councils said we'd rather have fewer, and some councils wanted more councillors. So we go into it with an open mind and we take their views into account. I wouldn't assume that because we're working to a different set of legislation here, it would necessarily result in more councillors overall, but it could do. Um, Roddy, I'm going to let you come in. Uh, you don't specifically have to answer whether there's too many councillors or too few, but... Uh... I, th I think I'm quite happy to say that the main aim today is to allow us to see an amendment to Schedule 6 to allow the Boundary Commission to set uh, different ratios for individual 
islands or groups of islands which differ from mainland areas. And that's the focus we have today in terms of the one, two members, as opposed to three, four member. And we didn't think that we would be talking or focusing on the actual numbers, total numbers. But just to give you an example, we have 31 members at the minute. I think earlier, in earlier days, the Boundary Commission suggested a review around 28, I think. And um, at Turkey's on Christmas, we suggested 26 ourselves. So we're quite flexible around the total number. We're realistic about it. And it's, it's, that is not our, our driver today. Our driver today is get more appropriate and flexible representation for the islands in this context. Uh, does anyone want to come back on that? Oh, Fulton, do you want to get to no, no, no. I'm happy no. that, convener, thank you. Okay, Jamie, the, the next question is Thank yours. you, convener. Good morning, uh, panel. Um, North Ayrshire Council uh, said that the bill um, made provisions for adjustment towards sizes, but not the uh, electorate to councillor ratio. Uh, obviously, it's far easier to service uh, a few thousand uh, uh, voters in, in a urban area than it is spread over multiple islands, for example. Do you think that those provisions should be made in the islands bill? Or the ability to change, indeed? I think to do that would be tantamount to saying that parity was no longer paramount, because that remains the position under the main legislation within which we work. Our feeling is that, in the spirit of what this legislation is seeking to achieve, the ability to have choices between one, two and three and four member wards in the island areas would probably get us to a position that was comparable to that. If you take Aaron as an example, you could construe quite readily a means by which you would change the current representation on Aaron. That might mean that um, there was a different ratio applying in Aaron to the rest of North Ayrshire. You wouldn't have to have a provision in the legislation to achieve that end. You could do it by means of what's being offered in the legislation. And I think as a commission, we would advocate not having uh, different ratios within council areas because the rock on which we found really has to be parity. We can work around it as we have done in the past and we'd seek to do again here, but not to have it doesn't give us a strong enough framework within which to work. And I would come back to the point that the main objective of what we do is to make sure that democratic representation in this country is as fair as it can be, and comparable ratios within our council is an important part of that, we think. Derek wants to come in. Yeah, uh, from the course point of view, we're not advocating a, a, a move away from parity, it's just that the Boundary Commission has that uh, flexibility to take, take account of uh, geographical circumstances in an island area, and we don't actually see there's been a great move from parity, but maybe some, sometimes it may be more than a 10% change to take account of these these circumstances, but certainly parity would, would remain a key issue. Uh, Rod, did you want to add to that? Or are you, uh... No, I think, we're, I think we're thinking the same thing. We, uh, we do, I, I wouldn't like, as I say, to go back to saying that parity, I, I know that the Boundary Commission considered it to be paramount, and I think if I could find a word a wee bit below paramount, I might go for that. But parity is important and it's crucial, but... I don't think it should be the sole driver of how we calculate these things, and I think that uh, the flexibility that I think we both agree that would be good in this context, in the island context, and something that we should work on, and I think might inform and feed into different ways of doing things in other areas in the future. Yeah. Jamie, do you want to follow that up? Thank you. I, I, I guess that leads me uh, nicely into the next section, which is around any proposed changes uh, which are coming about. Uh, I think, uh, Ronnie, you mentioned uh, that you would as a commission, deliberate uh, internally, but what sort of external consultation process might you participate in in an official fashion? How, how do you think that consultation might, might play out? Which stakeholders might be involved in that? And uh, the sort of timescale involved in, in that consultation to make sure that everyone's uh, opinions and voices are heard. I, mean, I think we recognise consultation is a very important part of our work always, but with the islands in particular for taking forward this legislation. I'm still struggling a little bit. So, so yes, we recognise consultation is very important. I mean, the Commission hasn't yet um, met to discuss how it will go about it, but I know there will be an absolute commitment to engaging not just with councils, but um, with communities on the islands um, as well. So taking that forward will be um, a priority. In terms of timing, there is, I suppose, a question of the timing of the legislation and not preempting any changes that might occur during its passage but we would be looking to take forward review in time for the next local government elections and that does point probably to beginning consultation um, early next summer. Jamie, 
No further questions. Richard, I think you had a follow-up. Yeah, yes, a, a question I've just thought of, and I don't think it's ever been asked yet. Um, anyone can stand for anywhere in the, the particular area they, they live in. Right, I, I stay in North uh, Lanarkshire, so I can stand in any, previously could stand it anyway, anywhere. When we go to a two-member island ward, should we stipulate that a person must live in the island? Or can we? Who'd like to... Uh, or, encourage, or encourage political parties. I know you don't like to get into the... You want to get into that vein, but... Uh, I encourage political parties to ensure that the candidates they select for island seats live on the island. Um, I'm sure you won't want to answer that one, Ronnie, but a, a general point on it, I think. Well, the, the general point is probably it's a better question for the Electoral Commission than the, uh, the Boundary Commission, but I, I can see that, and the uh, Western Isles might want to comment on this, you could make that so restrictive that it was very difficult to get representatives or candidates to come forward. And the other point um, that I would make is that, um, particularly when we're considering the possibility of going down to a single member ward as provided for in the, in, in the bill, um, there is the question about proportionality uh, that's quite important here. Uh, and I think as, as you draw the boundaries in more narrowly, and that's where your question's tending, um, you've got an issue straight away about where proportionality stands when one part of the council might be represented by a single member, other parts by two, three, or four, and I think to compound that by putting a territorial stipulation on it would make life quite difficult to manage. Just before I bring you in, Roddy, I mean, one of the, the issues that we heard when we went to Mull was the whole issue of, of where the council was set up and where it was working from um, and the travel that the member had to do in some cases round more than, the, than one area and just the difficulties of that. I mean, Roddy, perhaps you could sort of work that into your answer because I think it seemed to be a genuine concern. It is a general concern. If I can just build on what Richard was saying there, um, yeah, I, I would agree with uh, what Ronnie's saying there in terms of a stipulate, too many stipulations in terms of who are, can or cannot stand and I think it would be a, a, probably a can of worms and I don't think it's something that would particularly work. But funny enough, we think that by going down this one or two member ward and having the flexibility, we think that uh, because we'll have more natural community representation, we think that that will happen anyway. We just feel that more people will stand in their area because they know their area well. And I think one of our, all our aims is to get the representation of the people as close to the people as can be possible. And I think this will happen. What, what you're aiming for maybe in your question in terms of one way, I think it'll happen in, in, through this process. So, um, and, and that'll address the issues around travel and, and uh, I suppose if you were talking about money, just to continue on that, there may well be savings as well in terms of the fact that people don't have to travel for two or four hours to serve their community. Um, they can attend their community councils, etc., with a much lower cost and we release member expenses not that's something I'm sure you want to vote for, but we can release member expenses for frontline services. So I think there's a, a win there too. Um, and that, that actually is a very uh, clever lead-in. You must have uh, seen the next question because John, John's got a question. On the uh, finances and the financial uh, memorandum, uh, you'll not be surprised. Um, I mean, if I can start maybe with the Boundary Commission. Um, I mean, it's part of your work normally anyway to be looking at boundaries and routinely you're doing a lot of work anyway. So how much extra work is there involved in this? And I suppose therefore the question is, um, is the kind of finances that they're talking about in the financial memorandum realistic? Uh, I mean, some people would say, well, it's just part of your normal work, but other people might say, well, there's a lot of extra work involved in this. Well, um, in terms of local government, uh, the way the Boundary Commission works is cyclical, so the fifth reviews that are referred to that we just completed, they have to be done every eight to 12 years. And what that means is for a large part of, say, a decade, the Boundary Commission is dormant. Um, and lots of people think that's a good state for the Boundary Commission to be in. Um, but I think um, we should be doing our work on more of a continual basis. I think it works better. I think it's less surprising to people when you don't appear once every 10 years and say, we're going to have a look at your boundaries again because collective memory and organisational memory in many cases has been lost. In relation to this piece of work, well, you'll know that for the three island councils in the conventional understanding of it, 
um, the decision was taken by the Minister not to go ahead with the proposals that we produced. So that work had already been done. So I guess from that baseline, you'd have to say that for us now to do this again is additional work. Um, but we think it's the right thing to do. Um, we didn't have any difficulty at all with the Minister's decision. Uh, and I think it's part and parcel of what I'd like to see is a more continuous approach to our work. In any case, it would be a better way of using the scarce resources that we have, and I think it would be a better way of managing the business. It would always be somewhere in the background that these reviews were going on, uh, and I think the island reviews are a step in that direction. So, I mean, you said earlier on you, you'd be talking to both councils and communities, and, well, the councils, there's six, so that's not too bad, but the communities, there's quite a lot more. And I just wonder, you know, are the costs in the financial memorandum realistic? Because, I mean, I'm thinking you could visit all the islands, but that might be expecting a bit much. There will presumably be an impact on mainland communities which currently are sharing a ward with islands. So I don't know if you've got to speak to them as well. So, um, I mean, it strikes me there could be a considerable amount of work in there. H have you really thought through yet how you will do about, go about it in practice? Um, it was obviously an initial estimate. I think you're right. We recognise there's a scale of challenge, but it's difficult to preempt commission consideration about how it wants to go about that, whether all commissioners will visit all islands or if the work will be divided up. Similarly, for the team I manage, how we will address um, engaging. We want to do it positively and we're happy to take advice. I know the committee has been out visiting and you know, other people have been consulting in the islands. So I think uh, we were talking before we came in about the challenges of visiting a lot of the islands, but it's something we'll want to do. So, yes, it's a ballpark figure. It may well go up. So the, um, there's costs for travel, promotion and consultation, 160,000. So you think that's... Uh... Feasible. The largest part of that is a consultation portal, which up until now we've used an externally hosted one. We are exploring trying to do it in-house, which will bring that cost down significantly and therefore free up within the overall budget set um, more money for doing things like travelling. Okay, and additional staff, 35 to 70,000 as well. Well, again, the challenge for me is making sure we have the resources to service both commissions because we also work for the Boundary Commission for Scotland. So there'll be questions about finishing the 2018 Westminster Review. And, of course, responsibility of Scottish Parliament has transferred between the two commissions um, back in May. So pending decisions about timescales of that review. There's a bit of a juggling, but if we estimate, yes, maybe one, possibly two more members of staff to help um, with the review. And I think that's broadly realistic. I mean, can I also, also ask the council, because there, there's a cost in here suggesting 30,000 per local authority, um, which I guess is to do with consultation and that side of things as well, so that you get the view of your co communities. Um, and just, it, it just seems a little bit odd to me that it's 30,000 per authority, and that's times six, so that's 180,000, where North Ayrshire, frankly, as far as I'm aware, have two islands to talk to, and Argyll and Butte and yourselves have quite a lot of islands to talk to. Are you comfortable with these kind of figures? Comfortable with ours. Um, you'd have to ask Argyle about theirs, but uh, yeah, I'm comfortable with it. I think one thing that uh, it's, it's when you're living and working and moving about on an island, I think a lot of the consultation that we do is um, probably possibly more real and more ongoing than in a lot of other areas because we're so close to the people and their communities. And so we're garnering information. I mean, this issue around one or two member wards, for example, has been on our agenda for about five years. Uh, and so there's been lots of consultations about different aspects of island life and different government initiatives. But often a byproduct or one of the questions or one of the issues that arises in these consultations is this issue of one or two member wards. So already we've got a lot of information, a lot of feedback around this from our community consultations. We use a whole range of community consultation tools. So, yeah, we, we, we think 30,000 is, is more than adequate. Anticipate that in some areas there's going to be, it's going to be very simple, straightforward, everyone's going to agree. Other areas it's going to be more challenging and you'll maybe need to do more work in that area. Well, I think in our area, in the Western Isles, um, I don't think we have these challenges. I think, I don't think I would preempt it and say everyone's going to, going to agree, but I think that every consultation we've had to date around and that has included this subject, people like the idea and I think it would be more realistic and a more appropriate representation on, an, on the islands to have this flexibility of one or two member wars. Now, I can't speak for... To Paul, but that doesn't mean they're agreeing on where the line is? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we yes. haven't gone into the detail of no. where the line is. But, but again, I think we would be putting lines where people, where we know already innately where people would like these lines to be as long as they stack up with the Boundary Commission requirements. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks very much. Um, I don't normally do this, but uh, I'm, Ronnie, I'm very conscious you've travelled a long way, and, and um, Ronnie's comment that, that he, he was dormant for 10 years. Is there anything on the basis that we've got you in front of uh, the committee that you feel that we've missed in our questioning uh, that you'd like to bring our attention to before I close off this part of the meeting? Roddy, would you like to lead on that? Well, um, yeah, I mean, we are gracious. We do recognise that Ronnie has been dormant and we are offering we are offering the potential here for him to, to get out and about and meet and see our lovely islands. And I know that Isabel has already requested that she doesn't attend in the, in the winter, just in the summer. But to be serious, no, I think because of the whole Our Islands, Our Future initiative and the last five years we've been working very well with, our, with particularly in the Shetland and Orkney relationship, and I think a lot of ideas have come up through that, which is great. And this is one area that has come up via the Islands Bill. And we welcome the opportunity to come along here and, and uh, say what we have to say about it. And I think we would say that we've been realistic. We're offering uh, a, an alternative that will bring people closer to decision making. We're, we're following the community engagement and community empowerment agenda that we're, we're constantly hearing about, and I think this fits in very well with that. And in terms of island proofing, which has become a, an in phrase at the minute, it does give a, a different slant on how we do things in Ireland around the wards, so I think it's a welcome opportunity, and it's a good place to test it out. Thank you very much, Roddy, and, and you'll excuse my, my flippant remark, and, and if there's anything, Roddy, you'd like to add, uh, we'd welcome to hear it. Um, well, just to respond in kind, uh, turning this into a mutual admiration society, but I have fond memories of the visits that we paid to the islands in the course of doing the fifth reviews, and uh, I anticipate the same when we repeat them. I think Mr Finney's question is quite a, a good one about the, about the bill. It's not clear to me whether the 30,000 per council is supposed to be an allocated sum for each of the six, or whether it's a pot um, from which you would draw, and I think it might be worth getting some clarity on that, because I wouldn't want to think... Uh, that some of the work we have to do with the councils would be constrained by the sense that 30,000 wasn't enough to cover their expenses. I don't think that would happen, but I think it's worth getting some clarity on that. In addition to that, there's maybe one or two points that we'd want to emphasise in the light of the overall comment we're seeking to make here about the need for flexibility and the fact that we welcome the additional flexibility that the bill proposes. Um, the, the wording in the bill in relation to the islands uh, talks when, when, we're, uh, when it's uh, discussing the possibility of one or two member wards um, about islands wholly or partly within a ward. And we're thinking that it might be more flexible to talk about, sorry, it talks about wholly or mainly, and we think it'd be more flexible to talk about wholly or partly. And if you just think about that, because there could be examples where an island could be a minority part of a ward and it wouldn't necessarily fall within the ambit of what the bill is currently discussing. Um, but we think that that's equally valid for consideration if you're looking at one or two member ward possibilities. So we think wholly or partly would be better wording than wholly or mainly, and I think that's something we'd want to, to leave with you. Um, the other thing in a similar vein, I suppose, um, all in the context of more flexibility, is that where we are looking in an island uh, context, particularly for the islands where um, there's a mainland component, like, say, North Ayrshire, um, the bill doesn't currently provide for us to look at one or two member wards on the mainland part, but only on the island part. And it, mo it would be helpful in terms of flexibility if there was a possibility that we could look at one or two member wards on the mainland too, just to avoid clunky knock-on consequences of the fact that we've said in relation to Arran or, um, or Butte or whatever, um, one or two might be the right solution there, but now we have to see the ramifications for our Drosten and the surrounding area and so on. I think we'd be happier dealing with those if we had the option of going for one or two in those surrounding areas too. And again, I think that would be within the spirit of what the legislation is trying to achieve. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, just before I suspend, I'd just uh, like to point out that the committee is uh, looking forward to its trip to uh, Orkney at the end of this week and, and to the West Niles in the middle of October where we'll be taking evidence on the island bill. I'd like specifically thank the panel in front of us today for a attending the meeting, thank you very much. And I'd now like to suspend the meeting, uh, no, to close the meeting because we're going to move into private session. Thank you for your attendance. Suspending, sorry, not close the meeting.